What's up, Funkers? We're back on What the Funk podcast, a late April recording with two of my dogs. Ooh, Nate Dog. We got Nate Olested, Olestat, out of Austin, Beautiful. Texas right now. And Mr. David Clonch, who's building a little bit of a following with his own sort of mini podcast stuff out of the Seattle area right now. This is going to be a good one. We got a couple of dudes who have spent a lot of time in the recruiting space, primarily outside of oil and gas, but more recently as partners of mine within oil and gas. We're going to talk about recruiting, all sorts of things in terms of building up companies, hiring, the differences between SaaS, oil and gas tech, working in the oil and gas industry versus being in other industries. But before we get into that, I always want to get into the the people and who we actually are dealing with and talking to. So Nate Dog, checking in from Austin, Texas. Why don't you tell us who is Nate Olastat? What's up, Funk? Um, What's up? So that's a, I mean, I guess that's a good question to ask, right? Oh, first and foremost, I'm a dad. Of four little rugrats, but you know, been in the um, in the recruiting space for many, many years. Um, kind of started doing my thing straight out of college and fell into it, like most recruiters do. Um, since there's no degree for recruiting, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's one of those. I'm a marketing major, and I know that I kind of want to just make money, so I figured I'll get into sales of some sort and ended up in recruiting but so i've been doing that for a while um did the corporate thing for many many years worked at worked at google worked at rackspace went to a small um cyber security startup and helped them scale and exit then worked for a couple of other smaller companies um in in the austin area and before started my own gig a couple years ago so that's a little bit of background on me yeah Nice. Yeah. And we'll, we'll jump into even more. I'm, I'm curious about, I, I know you started at Robert half, right? I think you went to Clemson, you played soccer, but you're from Seattle, which is where David Clonch is checking in today. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Mr. Clonch. Yeah. So <clears throat> originally born and raised in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, you know, grew up with two older brothers, played soccer my whole life, uh, sort of like Nate. So we connected on that for sure. But uh, went to went to college a couple hours down the road uh, to Chapel Hill. Um, hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it didn't know what I wanted to do career wise at all. No idea. I had an economics degree and, and uh, philosophy degree. And I was like, what do I do with that? Um but uh, <clears throat> Oracle had a career day on campus and w- I went to talk with them and, you know, uh, they, they taught me a little bit about sales and overcame some of the objections I had. Uh, and so that's where I got my start. So I did the BDR program at Oracle um, and it was great for a year and some change. Um, I got a little bit, you know, uh, tired of the, the big company feel and I wanted to get my, you know, I wanted to get more involved. Um, so a recruiting agency called me and, uh, you know, taught me a little bit about recruiting and seemed like it had all the, all the good things about sales that I liked. Um, but it was a more interesting conversation, um, people's careers, people's lives and, and the impact that had on them, uh, rather than ones and zeros in technology. So immediately fell in love with it, was there for a couple of years, um, left after a couple of years to start my own thing. Um, and did that for four and a half years. And then uh, recently at the beginning of 2023, I uh, joined up with Nate Dog here. Um, and uh, yeah, we're rocking and rolling. Love it. So I didn't, I didn't know that you went to UNC. Um, yeah. To, my wife went to Duke. I'm not sure if I told you that. Oh, well, hey, there's some respect there. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that, that area is it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, you didn't tell me your wife was a dookie. Yeah, yeah, she was a dookie. She, um, she was there when let's see, it was like Mike Dunleavy and Elton Brand, um, Shane Battier, yeah. who's your daddy, Battier, right? That was kind of her oh, yeah. her period yeah. of time. So I think a little bit before Clanch, you were you were probably at UNC, but 
Um, yeah, yeah, that area is beautiful, man. My my little sister actually lives in Durham right now, and I don't get back there enough. But it's uh, it's an awesome, awesome area. So I I didn't realize that. So you guys were big company guys to start your career. So Nate, you you with Google. Yeah clunch you at Oracle. Talk to me about that a little bit. So I, I don't know if you guys are aware of this. I've never worked at a company that has more than 130 people. So I'm very comfortable really? in both startups, yeah, both startups as well as small companies, which is kind of why I carved out Funk Futures to work with emerging and smaller oil and gas tech companies. But I'm curious, like, what was that like? You come out, you're, you're, you're out of college, and then you work for a Google or you work for an Oracle. Like, what is that like? You, you just, do you get lost in the shuffle? Do you feel like the pace is slow? Is it fast? Because now you guys, obviously, you're working at a really small company. So, so talk to me a little bit about what, what is that like? Maybe you first, Nate, going into a Google and, and being on a campus and being one of many tens of thousands of people to start your career. Well, I didn't go straight to Google from from uh, college. I, I went to Robert Half, which was also another big, big company. Like it's like one of the big players in the in the recruiting space. And we it was very I mean it's it's it was a sales environment, right? Like much like anything, new freshies out of college, you're in you're in this cohort of people that are all extremely uncomfortable and thrown to the lions, right? It's like here's here's what you need to do. I literally had a stack of cards where they were like smile and dial. I was, I was actually wow. in Charlotte uh, where Clutch is from. And they gave, and I was like, it was day one. And my, my, uh, the branch managers, a gal named Sarah Obvious and, um, Jason Flanders, who was an ex Clemson football player. So me and him like connected really quick. Um, but they were like, open up a, a blank email. I'll type you a strip. Here's a stack of uh, hiring managers at Bank of America, Wachovia. Start smiling, Dallin. Call. Mm. You know, I was in staffing for temporary, like, off administrative and clerical. So it was like something new. I didn't even know what recruit that recruiting was a thing like two years before that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was a good experience, like working there. Um, I'm, I actually met my wife there. Um, some of my best friends um, to this day that you know we were part of that cohort of people that were just kind of thrown in then i went then i realized that like big company i wasn't crazy about it and i actually didn't like recruiting at all after <laughs> about a little over a year there so i went i went to a little startup like a golf marketing company in, in charlotte and we were like seven people eight people selling you know getting new uh, golf courses that help us sell discount rounds of golf and it was great Money wasn't there, but like it was an awesome time. And then I moved back to Seattle and I saw I, I actually worked for a smaller recruiting agency um, and did really well. So, like, I it was a few years before I got to the Google, but like when I got to the Google, like it, like, it was fun. Like, I, I needed a break from the agency and the hustle and the bustle, you know, like I was having my first kid and I was like, I want to be present for my child, you know, I want to be there. And so, um, it was, it was a good kish, kishy get, you know, like all the food you want when I got all like nap pods and all the things. Right. So, I mean, I was a little <laughs> bit later in my career, probably like, I don't know, like six, seven years into my career by then. So I wasn't like all like deeply eyed when I walked in, like this is the end all be all, but I was like, this is a cool thing. Like it's an easy sell. You're finding engineers that are building some of the most and solving some of the most complex problems in the world. Like that for me was like really interesting. So, um, yeah, that was that. And then I then progressively just went smaller. I uh, like went to the big Google, right. And then I realized like, yep, yep. Still don't like the big companies. I got, I, I want to have more of an impact. I want to feel like my voice is heard. Um, not that you can't do that at Google, but for me, like I just, you know, I was one of, like 400 people on the sourcing team, you know? Mm. And I was like, you know, I think I want to go smaller. So I went to Rackspace, love Rackspace. Uh, probably like the, one of the highlights of my career on the corporate side, phenomenal company, great culture, but there were about 5,000 people when I got there. And then I went to Duo and there were like 140 people. Then I was like, all right, this is my jam. Mm. Like 
this is the size. This is the thing that I can like really kind of like get behind, solve problems, and like really see what you were like, like what you were doing in front of you. And like you get the immediate re- effects from it too, right? You get the, I implemented this thing and this was the immediate result. And there was financial implications to it that, that were awesome, you know? And like, so that like, that really kind of filled my bucket. And then I went smaller after that and then i went smaller after that and they ended up like at a company called literati in austin we were like 15 people and it was a killer opportunity like so um yeah like i don't know i for me the big company thing wasn't wasn't really like for me um i like kind of being i like being scrappy i like you know not being like siloed and put in a box right i'm like all right if we need you to help solve some of these problems over here now, like how, how can you help? Right. Mm. So yeah, that's a little bit more deep dive into, into my story. And now I'm here with talent team. That's um, right. Crushing it. We're yeah. Yeah. Where we were working with like urban stage, like tech companies and again, helping them solve some of the challenging problems so they can generate revenue and build product and, and grow and raise more money and hopefully exit, you know? So, um, that's been fun. Nice. So your clutch, your path, I guess, was a little bit, a little bit different. You literally went right into one of the big brands, right? You went straight into Oracle. What what was that like as a 23 year old kid? So honestly, it was, it was great. I, uh, you may hear my kitten playing in the background, but, uh, it was it was awesome. I, I think it was um I'm I'm really grateful for the experience because what they did was hire a class of. Um so they went around to universities around the country and they strategically hired about five hundred recent grads, put them all together, took them to California, put us mm-hmm. up in a hotel, um, and during the day just had, you know, eight hours of sales training, getting uncomfortable, uh, doing crazy pitches in front of all of your peers, um, and, you know, ultimately becoming friends with those people. So I, it was really cool to be able to have a lot of people who are in the same boat, um, same age, uh, you know, all experiencing something new going through it together. Um, yeah. And, and we became friends and it, and it made some of the, the early, um, career cold calling, you know, all that stuff, uh, uh, more fun, I would say. I was going to say more easier, but uh, it was just more fun. Well, but, so uh, before before you go on, right? I do think in some ways it makes it a little bit easier. Um, in that, on your business card, it has a big brand. You don't have to explain to anybody if the company is going to survive. If you're going to be around in a year or two, it's like, well, yeah, just just Google us, right? We're we're Oracle. People know who Larry yeah. Ellison is, right? Uh, so I think in some ways it makes it easier from that perspective. Where I could see it being challenging is if you're in a group at Oracle that's selling something that people don't know about, because maybe then you're put in a box of not being an innovator, right? And it can actually be to your detriment sometimes in selling, where you're like, no, but we got this new cool thing, and it's like. Well, you guys aren't as innovative as company XYZ, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was a good foot in the door uh, and sales tactic to say, hey, we work with you on the database side. I was specifically in the marketing software division, um, selling products that Oracle acquired recently, Mm -hmm. like Eloqua or Responses, um, stuff like that. And... Uh, yeah. I mean, like people know Oracle, right? They're like, oh, okay. You know, quote unquote trusted brand, but, uh, they, they speak so often to so many people from Oracle from different departments that I think they're a little bit, you know, tired of talking to an Oracle rep. Mm. So, you know, the, the familiarity is there, but perhaps a little bit too much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did you stay on the West coast after, um, after Oracle? No. So they took us all out to the West Coast and Redwood Shores uh, for, I think, three weeks. But uh, I specifically requested the Austin office mm-hmm. um, where 
a third of the people went, a third stayed in San Francisco area. Um, third came to Austin and then a third, uh, was actually split between Reston, Virginia and Burlington, uh, Burling game. Um, yeah. So Northeast central and then West. Nice. So I want to talk a little bit and, and Clanch, you're a little bit newer, newer to this, but Nate, you know, I brought you with me to NAPE. You've been to some of these oil and gas centric events and you had some pretty candid feedback on this. Like, dude, if this were a SAS type conference, nobody's wearing suits, right? You got people wearing flip flops. You got people wearing shorts. You got people wearing hats. And that's like an yeah. extreme outlier in, in oil and gas, not to mention like, it's, it's a little bit of an older industry from the average age of the people that work in it. So talk to me about some of your experience in going to SaaS-specific technology conferences and then me bringing you to a NAEP and seeing what that was like. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's one of those things where like you can kind of like at a NAEP, you can kind of point out like who the big dogs are, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. like they kind of have that like executive presence to them. There's they like they're a little bit more buttoned up. Maybe they have like the nicer Rolex or right, like like the nice like nice pair of boots and cowboy hats rather than <laughs> the cheap boots and cowboy hats, right? <laughs> um, and like it's at a tech conference, and like they're you can't point out the CEO, like you like and everybody yeah. looks the same. There's a good chance that actually the CEOs weren't t-shirt and some shorts and so um it's i it's a little bit more like oh I, like you'd be sitting down and at the bar at one of the happy hours and having a drink and talking to ceo of a hundred billion dollar like tech company you'd be like oh oh okay didn't realize <laughs> that you know yeah. um but i mean that's i mean i knew i knew what we're what i like what nape was gonna be Right, like I, I, I married into an oil and gas family. I'm like my wife, like they are. They're south of Louisiana. They're they're in the oil and gas. Like most everybody in the family is affiliated with oil and gas at some point. That and crawfish, right? Oh yeah, farming crawfish. So, um, you know, I'm I'm. It was something that was that I expected, and honestly, though, like the conversations, um, on the oil and gas side at Nape, like were just as cool, just as like people were just as open. In fact, they're a little bit more open, right? There wasn't this, there was no pretentiousness. Like everyone was like, well, and especially with a couple of beers in, in, you know, down the gullet, like you were talking to, you know, I, mean, I was talking to founders of companies and, you know, like up like upstream operators and I'm like, oh, they have like billions of dollars in assets. That's pretty cool. <laughs> You know, so yeah. it's just, you know, it's a different, it's a different type of, uh, mentality or crowd, but still like, I very much enjoyed, um, going to that. And, and I'd love to hear Quanch's experience too, cause you know, he obviously went up to, to Denver a few yeah, weeks shout ago out. for the wildcatters stuff. Wow. Yeah. Shout yeah. out energy tech night. Quanch, thanks for coming out here for that. And the social octane, um, opening day event. I would say though, and, and Clunch, I want you to to talk about this. The <laughs> energy tech night is like nothing else in oil and gas. Like that, Nate, is so much more like what you would have at a pitch competition in Austin, in Silicon Valley, right? So, somewhere else. And Digital Wildcatters, I think, is doing a great job to bring some of those more mainstream tech type events. But like that was your your kind of uh initiation clunch into oil and gas. Tell me what you thought about energy tech night. Uh, yeah. First word that comes to mind is it was fun. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, even the venue was, uh, in a, was it nightclub? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just really fun. I mean, like that kind of sets the vibe for people to be relaxed and, you know, enjoy themselves, uh, talk to people. Um, yeah, like you said, I mean, I, I had a hint that this wasn't maybe a perfect indication of the rest of the industry, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> maybe a unique event, but it was cool, man. I mean, like, it was really cool to like, I guess, meet some of these founders and more uh, very technical, technically intelligent folks 
there um, and kind of uh, pick their brain and just see where they go down the technical route. Um, so that, that was, that was really cool. Um, yeah, it was just a fun time. Um, yeah. I mean, that is the tech industry though. Yeah, it's true. Just, I mean, it's just building technology, selling the oil gas. It's the same thing. You know, the same engineers, the same product folk, the same designers, like that are building scalable platforms for a specific industry. Um, yeah. So I, that's why, that's why, I mean, I don't necessarily just call out oil and gas. It's more, I think about these companies like that we're working with as energy tech, you know, yeah. um, they're building software solutions to solve problems in a, in an industry that needs that maybe a little bit further behind from the technology and the progression standpoint for that hasn't adopted it just yet. Like the tech, the other industries have. Yeah. I, I've said this on this podcast and, and various other places too. The technology at the wellhead and subsurface is like the, the latest and greatest and just absolutely unbelievable technology where oil and gas has traditionally been a little bit behind is within the back office. And what we've seen mm-hmm. really over the past, I'd call it maybe six years now is just an explosion of tech companies within the optimization automation kind of back office tech suite. And that's a lot of the recruiting that we're doing together, right? You guys have done an awesome job with some of the companies that are going through their digital transformation within oil and gas and uh, helping to sort of modernize that tech stack because it was a lot different, man. Like to, to be a disruptor 10 years ago in oil and gas would not have been considered disruptive in the industries that you'd probably traditionally played in. But now it's really coming close. Mm-hmm. Like the the field is still super advanced. The back office is catching up and it's happening at a at an exponential pace. Um, as far as recruiting itself, though, and Nate, we've had some fun conversations about this where you've said, dude, that conversation we just had with that guy or that, that girl would never happen in the SaaS world, right? Talk a little bit about uh, some of the differences I think that oh, you've boy. seen. <laughs> some of the differences that you've seen recruiting the last year in oil and gas versus recruiting in traditional SaaS. Um. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna um, you know, pick and choose my comments here wisely, but fine. Um, I don't know. There, I, I think there's just a lot. I I feel like the tech side is cares a lot more about the sensitivities, and not to say that like oil and gas doesn't, but it's just a little bit more like this is what we want. This is what we need, and like. <laughs> whatever like right you know so there there is a little bit more um i don't know buttoned up conversations around about talent and what we're looking for and um on the tech side and like more openness to like diverse backgrounds and candidate pools and um inclusion and all that which is all important and but on the one gas side i and or the energy tech side has been more of a let's just find like finding people and let's let's get going like yeah. like time is money let's let's roll right yeah. and so uh but I can, again i appreciate it. i guess i i'm very much involved in that sort of world like in with my in-laws and just that side of my family um so it's it, it's not a it's not a shock to me i can i can roll with whatever and how about like remote versus in office because i feel like we do get a lot of these conversations with companies like we need this person to be in our dallas office in our houston office and you say really we we can't find somebody that's remote and i'm like no we can't right is that something that you still yeah. see on the tech side or is that a little bit more unique to oil and gas um well i, th- I think the tech side is starting to kind of come back to that in office mentality a little bit why well, there's there's still like your like really strong opinions around remote work because quite honestly it was proven to work you know the pandemic really was that first like mm. moment where we were able to have a substantial amount of data that 
that proved that remote work was fine as long as you set it up and you created the culture and you can do it. So I'm still a huge proponent of remote work as I work remote from the house. But I think when, you know, you're talking about the oil and gas industry, which ultimately at the end of the day, what's the product in oil and gas? It's oil, right? Like where does oil <laughs> come from? Like you can't remotely pull oil out of the, out of the ground, right? And so like everything I think spur, like kind of like spurs off from that. And it's the, the end office mentality of this is where we're at. We need to see you in in person and um, to get things done. Um, so I think that's kind of the difference where the end goal on the tech side is a piece of software, right? Like mm. it's a piece of software that's solving it. Maybe it's marketing automation software or health tech software or whatever, right? Um and yeah, that's just my thought. What do I use, Bart? That yeah, I think I think you sort of hit the nail on the head. I mean, like in oil and gas, obviously, I'm still getting used to it and learning more by the day. But I feel like in oil and gas, it's you know people are in that industry, and so they're sort of if they've been in the industry for five, ten, fifteen years, um, they're kind of previously vetted because you know mm. if you're in that industry for that long you kind of understand what's going on, right? I think in software, um, obviously you're still in the software world. Uh, you know, the, the deal cycle is similar. The talking points are similar, but you could be in marketing software. You could be in database sales. You could be in basically anything that's a software. So, you know, I, I think it's sort of maybe a tighter knit community in oil and gas because you're all, you know, dealing with the same thing at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Totally, totally buy all those points. And I, I had a good conversation with one of my friends who's a VP of IT um, in Denver with one of my clients just the other day. And they were talking about how remote work is is not a thing for them. And I was trying to distill down exactly why. And I think it's because it actually can be culturally disruptive for oil and gas companies to allow some people to work from their house while other people are always on site out in the field, right? Working from the dog house, working from their field office and not ever permitted to really work from home, right? So then you start to develop this, well, that's not fair, right? I've got to be out here on site. Why don't they have to be on site? I think it's a different yeah. balance that oil and gas companies have to have. And in some ways you see, okay, we're a technology company catering to that. Like we're going to operate in a similar fashion where yes, we Very, do yeah, allow- that's a good point. Right? Yeah. So it, it's, it's just a different industry because like you said, you don't pull oil out of the ground. You don't, you don't drill you know, uh, 10,000 feet down and 10,000 feet across remotely. Somebody's got to be there to monitor that. Yeah. And make sure that you're not, yeah. you know, doing anything too crazy. So it, it's fundamentally, yeah. I get it. And it made sense during COVID that a lot of the, the things that I had to do were people would come to me and ask, because I've worked remotely. I've worked from home since 2010, which is an outlier. That was like very early for people in oil and gas, but I've been in sales, right? And I've been primarily an individual contributor where offices didn't exist nearby at smaller companies. So I didn't have an office to go into. So a lot of people who worked in the oil and gas industry that I'd been selling to for years and years would come to me and be like, so like, how do, how do you do this? Like, how do you work remote? And, and you might find this funny, but before doing demos, I would have some people come on and be like, can we do a test run of your Zoom software? right? To make sure everybody can join and we don't have issues when we're joining because that wasn't never a thing, right? If I came in to meet with people to sell to somebody, I'm on site, whether that's in Midland or Pittsburgh or Bakersfield or downtown Denver or Dallas or Houston or wherever, it doesn't matter, right? And I love that old school kind of face-to-face business approach that oil and gas has taken, but it's shifted, Right. I think a lot of companies were forced to adapt yeah. and they realized, hey, there's some efficiencies that can be gained from this, but I don't think oil and gas will ever move to a completely remote environment. There's only one company that I know of that's EQT Corporation out of Pittsburgh, which is run by millennials that operates in a fully remote manner. Yeah. 
Um, it's funny though, because like, for instance, my brother-in-law would work in oil and gas, like for services companies for a while. And he's now in uh, Lafayette area. But when he was in Houston, he was up in the woodlands and it's, and his company was downtown Houston. Mm -hmm. And he was like, every time saw him or talked to him, he was just like agitated. Yeah. You're like, what's going on? And he's like, God, it's like, I hate that commute. I hate that commute to downtown <laughs> Houston. It's like it's like an hour or something each way. And he's like, God, God, I hate it. I hate it. You know, he since has gotten out of the oil and gas industry, but, but that was kind of part of it, right? Was was that mentality? It's like, I don't want to have to be in the office. Um, but you know, like you're still gonna have people that hate it, and there's still gonna be people that want to be in office. You know, like that's just then when you think about it, like you're talking about sometimes two two and a half hours of uh sitting in car like commuting yeah like yeah. is it make that do you make that up being in the office like is it that much more of a benefit right um uh, but we we're starting to see more companies on the loan gas the energy tech side funk that that are more open right to yeah um to remote people but we're still kind of seeing it's like we're open to remote but can they be <laughs> Houston, Midland, Denver, Oklahoma City? Right. Like, just in case. Most, uh, yeah. Yeah. Just in case. It's like, well, what about somebody who's next to an airport? Because, <laughs> you know, we, cause we do a lot of recruiting to go to market, right? And energy yeah. tech. And so it's like, they're going to be on a plane 50, 75% of the time. Anyhow, like, does it matter really if they're in that, that corridor? Or can they be in New York, right? Well, we, we're we're seeing that right that specific challenge, right? Where it's like, wait a second, we got we got some somebody who can really sell or somebody who can really code, but they don't want to leave Los Angeles, right? They don't want to leave Kansas City. They don't want to leave New York or Philly or DC. It's like, can we still figure out a way to make this manageable? Um, and sometimes the answer is straight up no. Um, which is one of yep. the challenges that we have to deal with. Relocation packages are still very much a thing. Um, so you yeah. guys kind of traded places, Clunch. You you lived in Austin and then moved up to Seattle. Nate, you're from Seattle. You kind of ended up in Austin. Um, talk about that a little bit. Like, are, do you guys like where you're at right now? Nate, you love living in Austin. Clunch, you love living in Seattle. You guys want to trade places? Mm -hmm. Like, what's going on? Well, depends on are you asking me or my wife? Because <laughs> that different answer. I I love Austin. The Austin area is it's a great place. Lots of fun things to do. It's century what I actually love about it is it's century located. It's mm. easy to get anywhere in the country. Like there's no flight that's over like three and a half hours, really. Uh to get anywhere you need to in the country. So that's that's good. But you know, I'm a Seattle. I, I'm born and raised in seattle i miss it i miss the mountains i miss the snow i miss the all the fresh water and the salmon fishing and like all the things that come along with that but again it's a three and a half hour flight it's pretty easy to get get to and from but um oddly enough conch right now is sitting in my brother's apartment what um, he's, he's right he's, he's renting my brother's apartment so Anybody who's watching the podcast can see it. Like I've been where conscious many, That's many fine. times, right? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of it was like serendipitous, really kind of like, like he was moving up there, and like I was like, wait, I think my brother, because Clutch and I knew each other. He worked with me um, on one of my clients here in Austin, so we got to know each other. That was one of the big reasons why I wanted to hire him was I knew like what he was about, um, and he would add a ton of value to the company. So when he was talking about moving up to Seattle, I was like, I think I was just chatting with my brother and I think his place might be rent. Where are you looking to, to rent? And he's like, oh, I kind of want to be in the Queen Anne, like downtown Seattle. I was like, his condo's in Queen Anne. So I think mean, it just wow. all worked out, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, but. The serendipitous is definitely the right word to use. Uh, yeah, it, it was like perfect timing, exactly what we were looking for. Uh, you know, it. It's like recruiter stuff, right? Like you, you know somebody who's got an opportunity and you just, you know, make it happen. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, 
I, I love Austin. Um, I think that's where I became, that's where I became an adult. Um, I think it was eight years I spent in Austin right after college. Um, it's an incredibly fun city. There's a lot of like-minded young people, um, like-minded yet, you know, a decent amount of diversity of thought. Um, and you could drive outside the city for 30 minutes and just be, you know, in, in the country. Uh, and now I, I just, I love Austin. I got, you know, I could talk forever about it, but, uh, yeah, my, my girlfriend and I, um, we're, you know, no kids, uh, just got a kitten, <laughs> but, uh, we, we wanted to do something different while we could. And so we moved up to Seattle. We're, we're big, uh, outdoor nerds, I guess you could say. I mean, the, the mountains are just incredible. Just being able to go to three different national parks within an hour and a half drive, uh, every way was, uh, immensely appealing to us. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I love both cities, man. I don't know where we're going to end up long-term but it's been great here. It's been about a year that we've been um, in Seattle. You can always split the difference and just end up here in Colorado, but that's a different conversation. Hey, you never right know. In the middle, isn't it? Yeah. Work. Yeah. Back to it. Plus with all, with all the work you're doing in energy right now too, you know, it's very centrally located. Yeah. That's one of the things I do like about Austin too, Nate. Like there are some oil and gas companies that are based there. Green Lake Energy is one. Parcel yeah. Energy is one that was acquired by Pioneer. but. Um, Traditionally, it's not an oil and gas hub, but you always have a few companies that are based there, usually because it's someone that's like, I like living here and I run the company. And that's where we're going to be. <laughs> well, not only that, but you think about talent, right? Companies yeah. strategically like open their, their headquarters around like where talent is. Like, they're like, you wouldn't open a, a tech company. I'm not going to like try to like city shame. But like a small town where there's just no technology talent there, or you couldn't get technology talent there, right? Um, it it just makes it hard, right? But if you if you're trying to be a tech company selling into whatever, there's there's a larger density of, of talent in Austin. Um, we started seeing that, especially during pandemic, where people had yeah. the freedom to kind of live wherever they wanted to. They're like, I'm moving to Austin. I've always wanted to live there. My company never let me, but now I can. And let's go. Yeah. Um, and all the people, all the people who were homeowners like myself were happy about that because now our property's worth a lot higher. <laughs> and so is our property tax. That's so, is your, right. so is your taxes. The, yeah. Um, Not on the taxes, but. Well, so one of the things we like to do here on What the Funk here before we wrap up is we play a little lightning round. Okay. So I'm going to say a name or a thing. And you guys have to say the first thing that comes to mind, right? Very, very okay. minimal thought. Okay. So the first one we're going to do is, and Clunch, you can go first on this one, Marshawn Lynch. Seahawks. Nate? Do you want my reaction on that? Yeah. Hand him the fucking ball. <laughs> <laughs> Action on that. Nice. Oh, just hand them the ball. The Ox please. and Skittles. Russell Seahawks Wilson. and Skittles. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Peace mode. <laughs> yeah. Um I'll uh I'll throw another one at you. Silicon Valley Bank. Nate, you first. Oh. Uh debacle. Mm. <laughs> that's the first thing that runs through my mind like yeah it was an interesting one um out of nowhere but i think really that showed some of the weaknesses that we have in our in our financial market here and how quickly something that big could could tumble you know so debacle scary i think it's actually mm. really scary kissing that um yeah I mean, it impacted a lot of my clients on the tech side, and um, it it's people are scared now. Yeah, I was very fortunate to be shielded from that a little bit um, within oil and gas. Was worried about that within the oil and gas tech community, but um, most of them weren't involved with SVB. But I saw it firsthand, with certainly with what you dealt with with a lot of your clients. Um, 
not fun. How about you, Clanch SVB? Well, I got. I was driving up. Yeah, first word that comes to mind is hubris. Uh, yeah, I think it was just overinflated value. Chapel Hill and, word uh, right there. Yeah, that's a big <laughs> word. <laughs> I had an economics uh, professor in college. He would just randomly go hubris uh, <laughs> as a <laughs> as an excuse for any sort of type of economic collapse. So uh, I suppose that's stamped in my mind um, for eternity. But yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Um, I'm not extremely educated in the area, but it just seemed like, you know, the principle of, of, you know, thinking about all like future value and inflating value, um, over time with so many companies, uh, catches up with you. So. Mm. Yes. I mean, this could be a whole different podcast. This could be it, a whole separate could. podcast because I it could you know yeah, but, I have lots of thoughts on that. Well, the, you know, and and I guess like the merging of the the tech world and the the oil and gas world. One of the craziest things, if you think back to it, during the pandemic, the market cap for Zoom was higher than that of Exxon Mobil, and and it seems so insane to think about, but it really just was a reflection of the time. At that point in time, yeah. having communication was more important than having oil, as crazy as that sounds. That was the one brief moment in time when those market caps were where they are. And I'm not going to Google it right now, but I promise you, it's not anywhere close. ExxonMobil is no. certainly worth a lot more than Zoom. Well, yeah. I mean, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I know a ton of people that work at Zoom. Like, actually, a buddy of mine was one of their uh, the leaders on the recruiting team. And when they're ramping up during that period, like I was like, why are they ramping? Like they, I think they hired, I don't know, like 40, 50 recruiters or something on the team. It was something wow. crazy. I'm, don't call me on. Yeah. Don't call me on the number, but I know it was a ton of people because, um, I just kept seeing new announcements, like new tech recruiter, new, new tech recruiter, new tech recruiter. And I was like, what are they building? It's like a zoom. It's a video conferencing platform that already works pretty damn good. Like, mm-hmm. what else are they building? And so I think that was part of, like, we're going to get into a um, little deeper conversation around, like, the macroeconomic problem of what happened and why we're seeing so many contractions now and, and layoffs. It was just, like, there was major bloat, lots of recruiting, lots of growth. And mm-hmm. uh, and, and you look back, like, okay, well, they have the money, and they're worth a hell of a lot of money. And they're growing and scaling, but like, what are they, like, I, I just, you know, I couldn't wrap my head around it. But now you look back and they since have contracted a, a good Big bit. Time. Um, yeah. And so like, that's part of the whole SBB thing, right? Where the, what David alluded to on over, um, over growth, um, valuations out crazy out of control. Et cetera. So, so I mean, um, similar things. Yeah. Similar I'll, I'll things. Leave it at Go ahead, David. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, like that, that's the challenge of it, right? It's like, if something is intangible, like a zoom, uh, it doesn't mean it's not valuable. Um, so who is to determine the value of something like this? Um, it's, it's a tough question, right? Um, I think with, with oil and gas, it's, it's uh, maybe it, it's definitely more tangible and you can see the benefits. It keeps the lights on. It keeps things going. Um, at the end of the day, you have something that has inherent value. Right. Um, I don't know. Like with some software, you could just copy it um, and do something similar with a little iteration. That's uh, that's different. Um, oil and gas at the end of the day, you know, it's going to turn the lights on. It's going to do something tangible and, and, and valuable. Yeah, uh, yeah. True. But at the same time, there's been an element of hubris that's that's been learned in oil and gas also. When when shale initially became a thing, um, and U.S. production soared, uh, as did prices, companies didn't need to think about being as efficient. And then you have a downturn. You have a couple downturns. Well, all of a sudden, you see lifting costs go down significantly, right? You don't need as many people in the right. field. Maybe you need technology. Maybe you need to become more efficient and, and create uh, and optimize your asset, 
so that you can look at what is my cost per barrel, not just how close is it to the price of oil or the price of my hedge. So, I mean, this is what the tech industry is seeing now is something that the oil and gas industry has gone through before. So it didn't totally come as a shock to me. Last yeah. piece of the lightning round. I'm, I'm curious about chat GPT. Your quick thoughts. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm going to go scary again. <laughs> same, same thing as the SVB thing. Uh, it's, it's scary, but it's also really damn cool. Right? Like, I now integrated it with Siri on my phone. I've integrated it wow. with my company's uh, Google Google Sheets and Docs. I've integrated it. I use it for candidate outreach to like refine messaging. I use it for writing stupid poems that nobody cares about. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, it's there's endless possibilities, and it's just scratching the surface. But it's one of those things for me. ChatGPT is learn how to use it to, to increase efficiencies and learn how to use it to, to make you better at what you do and, and remove the remedial tasks and stuff that take, that take time or else it's going to take you over. Um, you're going to, you're going to get passed up by other yeah. people that are. So that's, that's where I'm at on it. Like learn to, learn to harness it or else like you're going to be left in the dust. Yep. Clutchy. Agreed. Yeah, I think the the first word that comes to mind for me is opportunity. There's just, you know, I, I think so many s- smarter people than me. I think I'm going to be more of an, an, of an observer for the chat GPT, uh, you know, proliferation. But uh, I don't know. I, it, every time I, you know, talk to somebody about it, I learn something new about it. I didn't even know you could integrate it with Siri. It's like there's just so much stuff that can happen. Um yeah, I think there's a certain element of fear, but when I think about um, Nate and I were on a call uh, with uh, with Brian uh, earlier this week, and he was talking about how to pull a list of specific people at specific companies with yeah. their with their names. So, I, like that part of it is just very largely appealing. Um, could help eliminate a lot of busy work. So, well, that could also be a yeah. major threat to companies like Zoom Info potentially, right? And and others who are selling data as a service and an expensive service at that. If you can just say, "Hey, Chat GPT, um, what's the uh, current rig count? Who who's operating rigs in North America?" Well, if you can bring me back that information real quickly, that may eliminate my need for a subscription to a site that tells me that information. But there's still a little bit of waste. That's go, a really right? good point. You know, that the accuracy is, it, it may not be all the way there. That's and personally, the like, I'm a yeah. sales guy, right? You you know, I'm a sales guy. I'm a recruiter. You guys are sales guys. You're recruiters. Um, in conversations I've had with more technical resources, like, I think that it could be more of a threat on the development side of things. There's still a human element that's always going to be there, yeah. regardless of how far uh, something like chat GPT or AI in general goes yeah. like there's a, we're dealing with people, right? Someone leaving a job, taking a new job, someone's hiring, somebody's moving. These are very personal decisions. I don't see how you fully automate that. If you can tell me how to write a SQL yeah. script or you can even write it for me, that might eliminate my need for a specific type of coder. Okay. And now we're moving toward the the skills away from having development skills to having more of a, uh, a data science understanding. And what do I make of that code once I have it? So I, I think that it probably has more of an impact even in the short term on the technology side of things. But anyways, we're going to wrap it up here. This was super fun. I appreciate you guys coming on to wrap. Where can people find you guys, Nate? Where can people find your company, Clonch? Where can people find you? Um, I mean, talent.team is our website, www.talnt, no E, dot team. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, name Olstead, O-L-L-E-S-T-A-B. Yes, sir. Same thing for me. Um, you know, I think what, one of the things I'm, I'm, uh, beginning to do in this role is have a little bit more of a presence on LinkedIn. Um, so doing a little bit of a, a podcast, as you alluded to earlier, 
just having cool conversations with cool people and uh, posting some clips and uh, maybe a full episode if people are interested. Well, Clanch, I look forward to coming on yours and appreciate you coming on mine. Just want to say from a personal standpoint, it's been an honor working with you guys to this point. Um, I think you're tremendous at recruiting. You've helped me a ton. Um, And I I truly admire the work you put in, your work ethic and the partnership that we've started to form and, and the potential that we have to really bring continue to bring top tier talent into the oil and gas and, and energy tech spaces. So much love from me. We out. Yeah.